They're all bad. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Moss Creek Safety Seminar. We appreciate your attendance. Um, in attendance today, we have from our Beaufort County Sheriff's Office, PJ Tanner. And from Beaufort County Sheriff's Office, uh, their community liaison officer, Staff Sergeant Allen. Uh, I'm going to give the microphone to uh, Sheriff Tanner. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. We're happy to ask him if you have them for any of us. Just please. Uh, ask my name, and we're, we're happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Sheriff Tanner. Thank you, Jim. How is everyone today? Thank you. With all this great weather, and y'all not on the golf course, or did y'all go to the golf course before you came here? Yeah. Or do you plan to go after you leave here? I mean, you're going to be running out of time, but uh, I think you can get a couple of holes in. It's, it's Jim, it is great that, uh, that y'all are having these, these meetings like this are happening all over the county. Uh, and we, uh, we were very, very lucky to have the opportunity to come and speak to a group of citizens of Beaufort County. Danny, you'll hear a lot from uh, Danny Allen. Danny's been with the Sheriff's Office uh, a long time. His father was former coroner, retired in Beaufort County, uh, who also ran Beaufort County EMS for about 35 years before he became coroner. So there's a lot of service in that family. I, I want everyone to know that uh, y'all are very, very fortunate that y'all have Jim as your security chief in Moss Creek. He is a <laughs> super guy. He does a wonderful job. He's got a great relationship uh, with the sheriff's office. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity for our Marine Patrol uh, to use uh, to use your uh, uh, marina here. I have history here in Moss Creek as well. 2002, I got married to my wife at the Boswick House. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of history. And when I was a teenager, when you had the Women's International Golf Tournament here at Moss Creek, I worked on the golf course and I had the opportunity to cut the greens twice a day during the golf tournament. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I know these golf courses very well, not because I play them, but because I cut a lot of grass and raked a lot of traps at Mall Street. But I, I wanted to uh, just make a few comments uh, and I'm just going to be here. This is, uh, this is Danny's opportunity to talk about safety in Beaufort County. But I just wanted to give you some food for thought and some information and take the opportunity to, to, to be able to see everyone without masks on. Isn't it great to be able yes. to breathe? Yes. And you know, it, it's just fantastic. You know, everyone always asks the law enforcement, and I get the question quite a bit, well, Sheriff, what is the crime rate in Beaufort County? Well, you know, those are, those are really kind of hard nuts to crack from time to time because there's a lot of variables uh, that we have to look at. But the FBI uses a, a mathematical equation for violent crime or property crime per thousand residents. So the national average throughout the country is 3.9% on violent crime. Uh, throughout the country, and it's a, it's a mathematical equation that's really not fair to some extent. Uh, if you look at a county like Beaufort County, I give an example. National average is 3.9% per thousand. In Beaufort County, our bed population is about 200,000. And when you look at our bed population, you look at the crime rate in Beaufort County, based on what we report to the FBI, it's about 3.1%. So we're well below the national average with our bed population. But our service population is a little bit different. If anyone has traveled on US 278 or US 21 or South Carolina 170, you see the traffic. And you see the traffic in the morning and you see it late in the afternoon. Those are folks that are coming into Beaufort County to work, to visit, uh, and those are the ones that are going home in the afternoon. So our service population for any given day in Beaufort County is about 250,000. Our crime rate related to that service population is 2.9%. So you've got a 3.9 national average, 
We've got two percentages that we use, but our service population is, is the one that impacts the majority of our residents because that's a pretty good influx every day of around 50,000 people. I don't want you to fall asleep at the wheel. So 2.9%, it can be lower. And in order for us to do that, some of the tips that Danny's gonna talk with you about today are the ways that you can help not only your community, but help us lower that crime rate even lower. You know, unfortunately, there is a national narrative and a national trend throughout the country where it's tough to find men and women uh, that want this job as a career choice. And, you know, we can, we can look at just the food and beverage industry. We can look at the accommodations industry. You can go to your local dry cleaners. You can go to your local coffee shop. And you can see how employees are hard to find. Well, in law enforcement and public safety, that is a trend that uh, is not going to change anytime soon. The impact it's had on us in Beaufort County is I have 56 openings oh. at the sheriff's office right now. And that's a combination of patrol officers, dispatchers, because we dispatch for the entire county. We dispatch for all law enforcement, fire, and EMS. And that's also civilian employees. So that's a pretty good number out of a staff of 350 employees to have that many openings. We get applications on a regular basis. We go through them. We share applications with our other agencies in the county, the town of Bluffton, Beaufort, Port Royal, Yamasee, and also our neighbors in Jasper County, Hardyville, Ridgeland, because the, the thought for us is let's fill every vacancy that we have in, in, in first responders. So if we need more EMTs, we need to fill those positions. If we need more folks, uh, more firemen, uh, we need to fill those positions. But on the law enforcement front, we have to look at things a little bit differently. Sheriff's office is made up of, if we pull staff, we've got 350 employees. The town of Bluffton is a little bit different. Beaufort and Port Royal and Yamasee and Hardyville and Ridgeland, but we want all of those vacancies filled. So we need to share that information. But here's what keeps our head above water. When we know what we are dealing with, and this is something we've been dealing with for a couple of years, ever since COVID became a national issue. And then when it, of course, when it turned political at certain points, it had a huge impact on first responders, especially law enforcement. We augment what we do with the security forces that we have throughout Beaver County, just like with Jim and his staff and all the other gated communities that we have. They do a tremendous job. And us being able to work with our security forces and augment those numbers to make sure that we are available to answer calls for service uh, are the things that we're doing in concert with each other. And that relationship is extremely important to us. There are things that security can't do. And that is, uh, you know, of course, that's uh, based on the regulations that they have to follow through, through the state. But there are a lot of things that we do together. And I, I, I must, I, again, applaud Jim and all of our security forces throughout the county. Uh, we appreciate the work that they do. And quite honestly, if it weren't for about 350 total of our security teams throughout the county, we would need to hire probably another 100 deputies just as call takers. So that would put us 156 short of really what we need to do. So we thank you as a community. Thank Moss Creek for supporting the security that y'all support here locally because it means a whole lot to us. I've had, had been born and raised here all my life and law enforcement this year is my 40th year. Uh, we really appreciate uh, all, the, all the help and all the service that we get from our communities throughout Beaufort County. It's an awesome team of, of men and women that do a fantastic job. And guess what? They've been here all along, all through COVID when it started until today, none of our men and women work from home. They were here working for you every day and they do an awesome job. So I will be here and I'm gonna turn it over to, to Danny. Uh, I'm, I'm here to answer any questions you may have, but I just, uh, Barbara, thanks for the opportunity. Jennifer, thanks for the opportunity to be able to come in and see y'all. Talk to you soon. Appreciate it, sir. Danny? All right, folks, it is hard to follow up behind my boss, but I'm gonna try to do my best. So as the sheriff said, I'm Staff Sergeant Danny Allen. 
Um, I do our crime prevention and also community uh, liaison. Um, I come out and speak to a lot of different groups about different things. Um, this conversation is not a conversation that only has happened here. Obviously, uh, some of you have had the same issues that other areas may have had. Um, so one of the things I do want to uh, tell you is one, what are some ways that you can get more information and be in contact with the sheriff's office? Because I do think that's very important to you all. But also, um, I do want you to understand because when something bad happens at one time, sometimes you can feel like, oh my God, we're, we're under attack. Like what is going on? Um, so I also want to want you to realize that you are in a very safe area um, and to talk about some of those things as well. So before I do anything else, I do have to give you all one homework assignment. And I want you to pull out your phones or pull out a pen. And I want you to take down this very important number. Um, if you don't have it, get it from one of your neighbors. Um, but take out your phone and just save this number. It is the non-emergency number to dispatch. Okay. Um, as some of you are pulling that out. First thing, if you have an emergency, obviously take the guessing out of it. Just dial 911. Okay. But I want to give you the non-emergency number to dispatch, which you may use for multiple different reasons. But I do think it's very important for folks to just go ahead and save that into your phone as a contact. Save it as Beaufort County Dispatch, yeah. Emergency Dispatch, whatever else. That number is 843-524-2777. Again, that number is 843-524-2777. Now, again, if you have an actual emergency, just dial 911. Um, you may have something that, you know, security is taking care of. That's not saying you don't get in contact with security, but you may use that number for multiple other reasons. Um, you may need information on something. You may want an officer to contact you back. Um, you may see something a little odd and suspicious, but you don't think it rises to the amount of an actual emergency, but you do think somebody needs to call it in. And it may not be just here. You may be driving up the road somewhere and feel that, what number do I call? I also say that because I'm going to give you where our Hilton Head office is and what our Hilton Head number is. But one problem we do run into is that a lot of people, when they feel they need law enforcement, may feel they need fire, may need EMS, they Google the number for the Beaver County Sheriff's Office. Here's the problem with that. After five o'clock, if you call that office number, you're not reaching someone. You're reaching a voicemail because the office is Monday through Friday, not counting holidays. Um, and obviously not count those weekends, and it's eight to five. So if you call that at 515, you may not reach someone. Actually, I had an email when I came back to work this morning, I wasn't at work Friday. I had an email from a lady saying she saw, heard shots fired this weekend. So she sent me an email. <laughs> don't send an email. But we also don't want you calling that number for that. Either call, dis the, call the dispatch number, all right? Where if it's that non-emergency, or an actual 911 call, okay? But if but that's why I think it's important to have that number. So again, if you need it, 843-524-2777. Now, for those that don't know where our Southern office is, our Southern, Southern office is actually located just over the bridge at 70 Shelter Cove Lane. Uh, again, that's 70 Shelter Cove Lane. And the office number there is 843-255. 3,300. Okay, again, that's 843-255-3300. Um, so in that office, we, it, you have um, higher ups working in that office. You have investigators working in that office. You do have deputies in and out of there. Um, we have a, an on-call, on, on office, I mean, in the office deputy that will answer some calls if somebody does call. And we do have um, some records clerks and we have some volunteers in that office as well. Um, if anybody's interested in being a volunteer. Um, but if you, Monday through Friday, and you were needing to contact someone that you wanted to just speak with someone or maybe report something, you can call that. But again, I would tell you, call that non-emergency number. Um, I think that's also, again, very important for you. So the sheriff actually mentioned some things that I was going to mention. Um, but one thing that is very important to you, when it comes down to safety, when it comes down to crime prevention, it really starts with the knowledge that you're able to gain. The more information you have, the more knowledgeable you are, the safer you can actually be. Uh, where that's knowing your area, 
um, knowing some safety tips that are good for you. So the sheriff's office does try to stay in contact with our community in multiple different ways and provide information to our community in multiple different ways. Um, in the past, I would say using this, just go to the website and we may have some things on there, but especially a few years ago during hurricane season, um, when people were going to social media and getting some bad information, being told they can come back in when the roads are still flooded. And we're not in any control of that, but we did have to start push, finding other ways of pushing more information out to people that you know are coming from a fact check source like ourselves, not someone saying, I heard it from, no, you can actually find it from us. So I do wanna invite every one of you to go to our Sheriff's Office website at some point in time. We actually just updated it in a few months back. So if you were there last year, it looks totally different this year. Um, the Sheriff's Office website is www.bcso.net or you can Google it. If you do Google it, Make sure you're Googling Buford County Sheriff's Office in Buford, Buford. South Carolina, not Beaufort, <laughs> North Carolina. Spelled exactly the same way. Both, you know, beautiful towns, of course, ours is better, right? But please go to the website. Um, that website is always updating. There's always other things on that website. But also, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the website, you will see multiple different links. Again, the Sheriff's Office is trying multiple ways to get in contact or push information out to our community to help keep you safer. So we have a Facebook page, we have a Twitter account, we have a YouTube channel. Um, I believe we have an Instagram now, um, but we have multiple different ways of trying to get information out to our club um, to include using Nixle. How many people in here use Nixle? And some people may have it, don't even know what it is. How many people in here get alerts from the sheriff's office, wherever it's through text message or through email? All right. Um, I know y'all just freshly moved here. So I'm like, what is Nixle? Um, it is N-I-X-L-E. Um, you can go to the sheriff's office website and actually find that. But that is a way for you to get messages directly from the sheriff's office. It's Text message or email, I will say if you've noticed, you probably have been getting less text messages, but more still the emails. That's something totally out of our control. It was something with the company and them being charged by these, out, these phone companies. So they were sending less text messages. But now you will not get it on everything. So if you leave out of here right now, you see some police lights like, well, what's happening? I didn't get a Nixon. You're not going to get it on everything. All right. And no, it's not going to be instantaneous. OK, but we've all driven across the bridge and there's been a wreck. And how many times did you get a message saying there was a wreck? So, you knew I'm not going to Hilton Head today. Yeah, right. right. Um, it can be helpful in other things. It may be helpful for a missing person. It may be helpful when we have scam alerts that we know of. It may be helpful if we've had other issues, crime things that have happened. We will try to push that information out there. Because again, trying to connect with the community and, and give you more ways of gaining more knowledge from us, getting more information from us, also helps keep you safer, okay? So again, just look that up um, on our website, go to our website, scroll down. I tell people, share it all the time, go to the website and be as nosy as you want. <laughs> oh, click on everything and just look around and see what may interest you. Um, I also wanna take a moment and invite you all um, we host a couple of different programs for our citizens. One program that is gonna start, it's, I believe the registration is already full because it's gonna start March 8th, is our CERT program, um, which could be helpful, especially if you have some folks that, you know, you don't mind cutting down trees and doing some other things, especially during bad weather parts of the, uh, times and stuff like that. It may be interesting to you. It's some free training that you learn a lot of different things from not only law enforcement, but also fire and other agencies that assist with that. But we also host our Citizens Police Academy class. I know at least one couple in here that tried to get into it, but unfortunately the registration closed right before they were able to get into it. But that is a free um, nine week course where you can learn multiple different things about the share, our sheriff's office and law enforcement in general and our area. But again, it's more knowledge to you. The more knowledge you can have, again, the safer you can be, okay? So please make sure you go to those things and look at that. So 
let me go ahead and get into the meat and potatoes of what you're really here for, right? Unfortunately, beginning of the month, um, and one or two of you in here may have been someone who was a victim of that. Uh, unfortunately, some of you had, some of your vehicles may have been opened up or it seemed like someone went through your vehicle, maybe something was taken or whatever else. Um, that can be a scary thing for folks when you felt like I live in a safe area. Um, and then something like that happens and it really makes you wonder, okay, well, how safe am I? Um, it can feel like a violation. Um, you know, are, are, are we, is our area under attack? Is something going wrong here, right? Um, and I will say sometimes we can have a false sense of security. When we have a gated community, we have security, we haven't had any other problems. And even though we don't want anyone to be alerted to the point where you're paranoid or anything else, at the same point in time, I do want you to know you do live in a very safe area. Um, I did myself and Sheriff, we had actually had stats pulled to check just to make sure, let's see what the stats look like. I know the stats that I had pulled was from February 18th of 21 to February 18th of 22. So I had stats pulled for the whole year. Um, and just to give you a few, what were the top calls in your area? For some reason, 911 hang up calls was the number one cause that y'all had in your area, which was 63 calls. Now, some of those could have been mistaken calls, some could have been medical, um, some could have been other things, but there were 63 911 hang up calls. The next number one call in your area, or a call for service, as we would call it, is extra patrols which were 62. Now, some of you may wonder, what is an extra patrol? That is actually when sheriff's office deputies are actually coming in and out of your area, and we're doing a patrol of there. That doesn't mean something negative has happened. That meant that while they were doing their patrols of the area, they decided, I'm going to go in Moss Creek, and I'm going to patrol different areas in here. And we've heard sometimes where some folks will say, well, I don't ever see deputies in here. And then we'll look up and say, well, this is how many times on their free time that they just decide to come in here. Now, again, you have a gated community, you have security. Um, so they're doing their own patrols, but those are different times where those officers came in here. And I will say there are, that shows 62, but when we sign out for extra patrols, within two minutes, our dispatchers are automatically checking on us because we have to respond back to them within two minutes. And if not, they're going to be checking and checking and making. So a lot of our guys, they will come in, they will sign out, and then they'll go ahead and say that they're okay, but they're still rolling around in the area. So that 62 is probably, is actually probably a small number compared to the many times that they're actually in here in all the areas they're going down. The next amount of calls, uh, a large amount of calls was civil process. Um, so that's a deputies coming in, serving whatever paper, a subpoena or something else. And that was 24. You had 18 activated alarms, which I'm pretty sure most of those were accidents. Someone coming home with their hands full and tripping their own alarm or bad weather. Um, our next largest number uh, was case follow-ups with 12. And then the next one was health and welfare checks with 10. That was your top six calls in this area. And you see how it started to quickly trickle down to 10 calls. Uh, and of course, health and welfare, maybe someone checking on one of their neighbors that they haven't seen in a while, maybe a family member from somewhere else calling in and saying, I haven't spoke to my dad or mom in a while, and can you please have the officer go by and check? We will do that. And we probably just found them out on the golf course playing golf and just didn't want to be bothered. But that was our top six calls in your area. So what about some of the other calls? Low calls, we had one reported trespassing to us, one actually through that year, one actual stolen property call reported to us, and then we had, as, fat, as far as reported to us, breaking and entering, we had three. Now, that night you had more, but some, if nothing was taken out of the vehicle, the victim may not have decided to actually go any further with law enforcement. You may have said something to security and said, well, nothing was taken, so it doesn't go any further with law enforcement. So that may be why that number is also kind of low. But that's where that sits. So that should also help tell you, you live in a very safe area. I will say with those three calls, all three of those were unlocked vehicles, which takes me into what is a big problem? 
Our number one crime and probably in our area and probably our number one crime nationwide is breaking and entering some mo uh, motor vehicles, but they're really not breaking in like how we think. They're not smashing out the windows. They're not taking a brick or a stick and breaking it out. But what they're doing is they're going around and they're touching doors to find an unlocked vehicle. And if they find an unlocked vehicle, then they go in, rummage around, grab what they can grab it, and they leave, right? Um, they probably touched a lot more cars that were unlocked. I mean, that were locked. But if they're locked, they kept moving. Now, does that mean that if they see something valuable in the car that they won't break out a window? Every once in a while, we do get a, a window that's actually broken out. But most of those times is also because there's a valuable thing, an iPad, um, a purse, something else that's left out for that person to see and they know they want. Where am I going to get? Folks, one, we have to lock our cars. Mm -hmm. Even if it's in your garage, especially with that garage door left wide open as well. So if it's in your garage, close the garage door, but still lock your car. Don't leave your keys in that unlocked car. <laughs> Most of the stolen vehicles we have had within the last few years have because have been because they've left keys in those unlocked vehicles. So make sure that you're locking your car, even if it's in your garage, that you're closing your garage doors. And I also do want to say, folks, make sure that that interior door to your garage is also closed and locked. Um, we haven't had um, we have actually ha haven't had many people going into anyone's home. I'm I'm very thankful for that, but please make sure you're not giving that person opportunity. So make sure you're locking all these things. Um, we've been asked before, uh, well, are they breaking into the garages? Are, there, are they using something to get into the garages? I've seen on TV where somebody can have a little remote and they can copy your, your yes, that could be a case. That's not what we're seeing here. What we're seeing is they, this is really a, this trend is all opportunity. They ride by, they see a car, they check a door knob. If it's unlocked, I'm going in. If it's locked, I'm not touching it. So folks, please lock your cars. Um, one example of that is, and this was not from this area, but on one particular night, because the deputies, we do get a, a breakdown of different crimes that have occurred each day. And one particular night in a whole nother area of Beaufort County, there were 16 cars gone through. And out of those 16 cars, two guns were stolen. And neither one of those folks had the serial numbers on those guns. Uh, and so those are out there. So again, please don't leave valuables to include, include weapons in your cars. It's not doing you any good in your car anyway. Don't leave valuables to include weapons in your cars, but please lock your cars, okay? That right there will help knock down, be a deterrent to a lot of things. Um, there is a thing called like a 9 p.m. routine where no matter what, even if you know you did it or not, we're at nine o'clock each night before you lay down, people just go ahead and get the car keys, go to the door, go to the window and just lock the door. That way you know it's locked. Um, because most of these things are occurring sometime throughout the night, once everybody else has kind of settled down. It may be three o'clock, four o'clock, two o'clock into the night. But if you know at nine o'clock each night you have locked the door, you're, it, it, that helps out. Looking at a lot of these cases on two of the cases that actually did occur here, when I looked, both people, while well, one person, I think she went out of town and left the car at a family member's house. Another one, the guy, he left his car there and didn't come back to his car in like two days. They really couldn't say when the car was last seen or when it was last locked. If you're now making it a routine that every night that you're doing that, you can at least say if you report to us, I know at nine o'clock I locked my car. So what does that tell us if somebody went in? It had to happen before nine o'clock because it was locked prior to that, right? So that helps out with a lot of things. But again, this is a crime of opportunity, folks. So try to not give them that opportunity. Um, try to limit your distractions when you're driving home, when you're getting out of your car, and when you're getting in your car. I can't tell you how many times while working patrol, I would be driving around an area and I see a car with their doors wide open. And I'm like, oh, somebody's broken into somebody's car. And just to find out when I go ringing the doorbell, 
that somebody was bringing groceries in or maybe they was dealing with the kids or the grandkids or they were so busy on the phone that they left the door wide open and it may have even been open all night long. So again, try to limit your distractions as you're pulling up to your home, tell the person, hey, I'll call you back or maybe even hold on while I'm getting out of my car. That's not just for leaving your, uh, locking your car. That's also for checking your perimeter and checking your area, making sure you're safe. When you're exiting in and out of your own vehicle, when you're walking into your house, if you're distracted, you're less likely to look around your perimeter. So try to limit your distractions. I'm pretty sure if we put these phones down that always seem glued to our heads, we may realize some of the unsafe things that we are doing, okay? Um, again, don't leave valuables in your vehicles. Um, any valuable iPads, we don't ever leave the phone, but iPads, purses, other bags, or things that could look like they are valuable. Um, you know, it may be an empty bag in the car, but if, if it to them, they don't know, they may think something's in it that prompts them to go in. And then again, making sure you're closing and locking those doors. Um, just some other safety tips for you. Uh, lighting. Now, I don't know what it is, but we don't like lights. We like everything dark. But what does that do? That gives a bad person the opportunity to work in the dark. So lighting is very important. Um, and that might be something that you have to check with your area, check with HOAs to see what is, a, what is allowed. But I will say lighting, especially wherever you're parking your vehicles, near entrances, is helpful to you. If you don't have a lot of lights outside your house, but you have lights on inside your house, I can be outside and I know everything you're doing inside your house, but you may not realize where, that I'm even standing five feet away. So lighting is very helpful, folks. You know, invest in, in, in better light. Um, cameras. It is too easy to add cameras to your home nowadays. A few years ago, it was a very expensive thing. You may have had to go through a certain company. Today, you can go to any store. You don't even have to leave your house and you can order cameras. You can go in any one of these online things and order you some cameras. They're uh, real easy to install now. You really don't need some other company. Um, you can monitor it yourself. You can even open it up where others can see it as well. But adding cameras is a very helpful tool. It is a deterrent, especially if it's where people can see it. Will it actually reach out and stop the person? No. But is it a lot able to help us catch someone? Yes. Or if they look up and see it, Will it stop them? Possibly. Okay. Um, again, locking doors, that's house doors as well. Uh, vegetation, we don't really pay attention to it. I know we like our yards nice and groomed, but, you know, being mindful of how high some bushes are because it, it may block your view from seeing someone outside your house. Uh, and also thinking about what types of vegetation you put outside your house. You know, they got some nice, pretty prickly bushes that would keep some folks from trying to get in. So just saying. Um, and, and also folks, again, just being cautious online as well. You know, a lot of us share a lot of different things. Like when we're going out of town, we're doing other stuff. Be mindful of that because you never know who could be watching. Going back to the cameras for a moment, something that the sheriff's office did start doing is you actually can register your cameras. You can register business cameras, um, you can register your home cameras with the sheriff's office. Um, all you got to do is go to our website and you can actually, you know, put your information in, you know, what type of cameras you have and your contact information. No, that does not give us access to just go in there anytime we want to. I can't just sit here right now and just say, I decide to look at this camera today. That's not what's happening. What that does do is it helps us if we had a, something happen in that area, we can maybe look at a list and say, hey, these people have cameras. Let me contact them and see if maybe any of their cameras may have caught something that could be helpful to us. And it could give us, at that point in time, we can ask permission to gain access to view it, but we have to have your permission first. And no telling, giving us permission one time doesn't give us permission every time. Okay, some people have asked about that. But again, you can register those cameras because it could be helpful. When you do get cameras, think about angles where you park your vehicles, where your entrances are. Those are some areas that you do want to make sure you cover. Talk to your neighbors. If your neighbor may have a camera that's pointed at a certain area, do you need a camera pointed in the same area? You may point it in slightly different. So between the two neighbors, you're covering the whole area. That might be something to think about. 
Um, and you can also look at different apps that which do allow you to share some ability of your cameras with some of your neighbors, um, or even just share certain feeds that you may download with your neighbors. So again, that might be other ways of helping everyone stay a little bit safer. Okay. So, you know, again, I don't want to terrify you with anything because honestly, I don't have any stats that should be terrifying to anyone. Um, you know, y'all, again, y'all live in a very safe area. The sheriff already said it. You know, we're very thankful for the security that you do have. You should be thankful of them too. Um, but, you know, that, that helped. But I don't care how good of a law enforcement, how good of a security company, you're always going to have somebody that wants to try something. Um, but if we're doing more things to keep ourselves safe, that lessens the ability for someone else to do something and also heightens the ability for everyone to catch that person. Okay. Um, so again, I do want to thank you all for allowing us to come out and speak, um, allow me to come out and talk to the group. Um, again, me and the sheriff are here. If y'all do have some questions um, and please, if y'all are a part of any other groups, I'll be here. I have some of my cards. Um, if you like someone to come out and speak about different things um, from scams and fraud to, you know, different crime prevention things to just even just having a deputy come in and being able to just ask some questions to speak, you know, please feel free of reaching out. Um, we would love to come out, um, you know, and, and come out and be able to speak to you. Okay, so just wanted to pass those things on to you. And I, and I do hope that, you know, it was some helpful information to you. And I do hope every last one of you takes the time, goes to the website, and tries to contact and connect with the sheriff, uh, sheriff's office in a different way. All right, thank you all. Daddy, yes, ma'am. Please meet me. Could you expound a little bit? We are new here. When Welcome. should we call? Thank you. <laughs> when should we call security versus the sheriff's department? Just say if we hear something outside our house or. Um, I mean, it really arises on, you know, your own feeling. Um, I would go ahead, because even if you call that non-emergency number, our role, or if we know we have security in that area, we're actually going to be con contacting back to security too, because they're right here. You know, we may have an officer that maybe a few miles down the road, security's right here. So depending on what the call is, security's still going to be coming anyway. Um, so that, that's one thing. And, and he may be actually able to speak on that a little bit more. I will say if it's an actual emergency and you're calling 911, um, and even with that security still may be coming anywhere, but we're still coming. Right. Um, but if you're just calling straight to security, um, then they may handle that first. And if they feel that they need more, then they may contact us. But if you're calling into that emergency number, actually, you're probably going to get both, depending on what the call is. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Great, thank you. Now, I hope that answered your question, but it really can depend on you know, different things. So, anyone else had a question before I moved up with? Yeah, I had one. You know me, I'm always full of questions. Um, it's kind of like a three-parter. Were y'all able to determine how any of these people got in? And that actually made me more of a question for you. Well, okay. And then the second part is... Um, you have cameras installed at the traffic light, correct? As far as the sheriff's no. office, or yes, no, not you, not not Moss Creek. But in other words, if there was a car accident, which of course you know how many there's been, are we you? Have, ready? Yeah, we have eighty six cameras throughout the county, which I and those cameras are in place for us to be able to control traffic through our traffic control center that we run at the sheriff's office. They're not recorded. And I knew that was probably going to be the third question. No. But, but uh, those cameras are to help us negotiate traffic uh, during a hurricane and reentry. So and you're not able to pick up like a license plate no. off of those. No. So forget the third part of my question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those, those cameras, we have a traffic management center at the sheriff's office and headquarters that's attached to our dispatch center. Yes, sir. And that's monitored all day long and in through the evening. So if we have a traffic accident out here at Falls Creek, traffic signal, we know about it right then and there. So we can we can tell deputies and negotiate fire and EMS to come in at whatever, you know, eastbound or westbound yeah. or to come from Buckingham Plantation or whatever, because we, we actually have a visual. Uh, but uh, we do not record 
uh, any of those traffic cameras at this particular time. Now we're making some changes for key intersections in Beaufort County to be recorded and we will keep those recordings for 72 hours. We have to do that because of freedom information. If the local newspaper uh, heard that Fred was having an affair with Sue and they were driving through the Moss Creek light at a certain time and certain day, then they want a copy of the videotape in order to see if they could see who's right. in the car. So keeping it 72 hours allows us to have it if it occurs on Friday evening, we've got the ability to retain that uh, videotape and then it'll automatically uh, rid itself on Monday, 72 hours later. So, I mean, that, that's a benefit, but we want to identify those, those intersections. On the security question, calling security versus the non-emergency or 911, you know, Danny's covered, Danny talked about 911 and everyone knows that. I mean, you were told to dial 911 when you were knee high to, to me. Uh, so, but that, I mean, that, that, is, that is a good, good question and we do get that question quite often. Uh, if it's routine, uh, you know, things that, uh, that, it, that you're involved in within your community, uh, then you don't think it rises to what you would consider a crime, then call security, call the main gate or, or the direct number. If it's something that security feels uh, that uh, someone else needs to be involved in, then they'll reach out and call us as well. But remember our dispatch center uh, at the sheriff's office dispatches all uh, first responder calls, so all fire EMS uh, and, and law enforcement calls go through that center. So when that call comes in, every sheriff's deputy that's on duty at that time knows about that call because it goes through our communication center before it goes out. So if it goes to Bluffton PD or the highway patrol because they're working an accident, we know about it and we're on scene as well. So, but that, you know, we got to be careful with that because, you know, if you have a, a question about something that's going on, I think to say that you have some uh, traffic issues within Moss Street because you're doing some road repair or something like that, that would be a question that you need to directly call security because, you know, things like that, calling the non-emergency number in Buford, the dispatcher in Buford is not going to know what you're talking about and they're going to have to seek information just to help you out with it, so. Hopefully that helps. What about traffic cameras? We good on that? Or? Yes, sir. Um, I was just going to say I've been on Nixle since the beginning, but for those who aren't on there, um, don't you have to go through Everbridge now? To get I think that's the, the yeah. company. Yeah. yeah. We we we've you been having some. Nixle, it'll show you that. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's an awesome thing. I I thank it you is. very much for. We've been having some contract negotiations. Our general counsel at the sheriff's office has been dealing with them quite a bit here for the past couple of months. We use Nixle a lot. We started using it in 2016, right after Hurricane Matthew. Uh, and they, they, they have gotten uh, very creative on how they're charging uh, for that service. <laughs> So we're using very creative ways to deal with them and negotiate those services, but we're not going to stop using it because it's a valuable, valuable tool. Uh, we'll just have to continue to negotiate uh, and make sure that we're getting the biggest bang for the buck because it's important. Our citizens know how valuable Nixle is because of what happened in 2016 mm -hmm. when we had uh, you know, bad information going out. So, but it will it'll it'll help you negotiate your day, especially yes. with, with the um, information you get on traffic accidents. Jimmy, anything I left yeah. out on the notify? I know if I can just add to, to it, Chair. Um, we have over 50 cameras in Moss Creek. We have eight on the gatehouse. So we have one in each corner of the building, and we also have four license plate readers. We do record all of that information it stays on our servers for about 45 days. So we do in certain instances, assist the sheriff's office in accidents. Oftentimes it is highway patrol, but the sheriff's office is always uh, involved in those accidents. So we do have a general view of the, the light at Moss Creek. Um, so we can assist in, did somebody run the light? you know, how long afterwards, things of that nature. We've had a lot of questions about how much time actually elapses between when the lights change. And 
you've called us, we've called the sheriff's office, it's Department of Transportation that actually regulates that. Um, and actually, and I, if you've read some of the articles we've put out, they've actually added a few seconds to that light over the last few years when the, the, the uh, flyover, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, actually opened up. So, but at some point, only a few seconds is going to go by and lights are going to change. What I would recommend to you if you're at that light is just take a couple seconds extra, look left, look right. If the guy behind you is beeping a horn, just, you know, nicely wave to him in your mirror. It's okay. With you all, know, with all five fingers. All five fingers. <laughs> That's right. Because we got it on camera, if you know. So, uh, so you know, the, the community does have quite a bit of, uh, of cameras throughout the community. Now, the questions also arise about, you know, safety measures put in place to prevent people from coming into the community. We were all young and we all hopped fences. We can put fences up and we will repair fences when they need to be. There's no question about that. But if someone wants into this community, we have roughly two miles of frontage to 278. We have Moss Creek Village, which by our sled certifications, we can't patrol. I mean, we can drive through there. If we see something, we're calling these guys. But we can't routinely patrol the Moss Creek Village side. We can, obviously, the Royal Point areas. But we are talking about two miles of frontage. So there, there is access points. To answer a question on how did they get in, nearly impossible to say. If we had any proof of that, we would have, we would have worked on prosecuting those individuals. Understand, in, in the areas, and you all know what areas were covered, right? I mean, Royal Point, uh, Peninsula, Stablegate, large areas. Nobody called security. There was no video surveillance of anybody creeping around their house. Nobody's dog was barking. I remember saying to me, my dog was five feet from me. How do I, what kind of dog do I have? This dog's not even barking. I gotta, I gotta get a new dog, right? No, don't get a new dog. It shows you what we're saying basically is, as, as the sheriff and, and staff sergeant explained, they're, they're riding around on bicycles. They're, they're checking doors very softly. They're, it's not their first rodeo, folks. These are people, if they want something, they're going to get it. But if you lock your vehicle, if you lock your house, you do all the things we've been saying, we've been trying to impress upon you. Yes, you're in a gated community. And yes, you are much safer than not being in one. But take those precautions. Do the things you can. I guess the reason I had asked that to start with was because, you know, like, I guess they still have it in Georgia. They'll take a picture of your license plate and then send you a ticket. So, you see where I'm coming from? Yeah, that's it. That? Oh, that'll be fun. Yeah, uh, Georgia did that. Uh, Georgia did that. And, uh, South Carolina considered it. Yes, sir. And uh, our advice to South Carolina was don't even try it. Well, I think they had it, didn't they? Have yeah, well, you know, it, it, and what, hap what happened in Georgia, I remember when uh, some of those traffic signals were uh, were cameraed, they were mailing violations to the registered owner of the vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, which there's, that's no proof that the operator, the car is not at fault. <laughs> it's the operator of the vehicle that's at fault. You've got to be able to prove who was in violation. The car is just being driven by someone. Uh, so the tag is just going to tell you who the registered owner is, but it's not going to tell you who's driving the car. Plus, their number of rear end collisions increased like three, four hundred percent. Because even if the traffic light appeared to be turning, before they got their picture taken, they would slam on brakes and they would cause a rear end collision. It didn't take but a couple of years for Jordan to say, you know what? This enough's enough with this problem. Because uh, if you've been on Abercorn Extension and some of those other areas, you get a fender bender like we get at the base of the Hilton Head Bridge in the afternoon, it shuts things down. So we try to keep traffic moving. The, the, the problem with our intersections is the size of the intersection. When we went from two lanes to three lanes, it created what we call a mega intersection. 
and we had left turn signals that would flash to allow, like, I'll give you one example, Buck Island Road at 278. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That person got killed there that was pregnant. We had several people killed trying to make a left-hand turn off 278 on the Buck Island Road and could not negotiate the turning radius and you know how many feet that actually is versus oncoming traffic, not knowing what speed of that car is and then and in most cases you know the speed was was either at the speed limit or higher and uh, you know simple mathematics you, you know you got an intersection it's a mega intersection and you think you got enough time to make the turn and all of a sudden uh, you get hit inside so we've encouraged dot to not allow the flashing and let people have a a, a green turn arrow mm -hmm. and then if it's not green sit there and wait for uh, the transition Beaufort County uh, did for years, we cut a deal with DOT. That's probably been about seven years ago now. We were actually controlling the timing of all the uh, intersections, all the traffic signals in the county. Beaufort County um, has an opening today for a traffic engineer because when our traffic engineer left, they turned that responsibility back over to DOT. Oh. DOT operates these traffic lights out of Charleston, South Carolina. There are no boots on the ground in Beaufort County that, um, that can do it. They do a lot of it by computer. We make a lot of requests uh, daily, weekly, monthly about checking the timing at certain intersections. I think DOT is actually doing a pretty good job of, of maintaining those timing. I know sometimes you think you, you'll sit at a traffic light for five, six, seven minutes. Uh, in some cases, it might be close to five. Uh, it just depends on what intersection you're in. Uh, so it, it, they try to do it timing based on rush hour in the morning, rush hour at lunch, rush hour in the afternoon. And has anybody ever been stuck in traffic on US 278 on a Saturday afternoon <laughs> where we got check in on Hilton Head? You've learned quite quickly that you don't go eastbound. <laughs> <laughs> on 278 on a Saturday afternoon. Those that have just moved to the area do not go eastbound <laughs> on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon in the summer yeah. because you'll be sitting in traffic for a long, long time. Question? Yeah, just had a quick question. I watch cops, which does not qualify me to ask this question. But I want to ask you <laughs> These guys that are driving little bikes around this area supposedly break into the cars. What are the odds they might be armed? Okay. Okay. So I, I read the apps or I read on the Moss Creek website. I heard something. I walked out. I'm looking around my yard. Well, I wonder if it is somebody out there that they're take they're risking. Maybe they ought to be warned. You, you don't want to get in a gunfight in your front yard or or face a guy. You know, you got a flashlight. He's got a. But do you find that a lot of these guys? What are the percentages? Do you have any stats on that? Are these young kids driving around, if they are young kids on bikes, are they carrying? Yeah, they're carrying guns that they have stolen out of a car. And, and, that, and that's the reality. We have had dozens and dozens and dozens of firearms stolen out of unlawed vehicles. Gated communities and, and you know, outside of gated communities. Look, here's, here's the reality, and, and Jim was talking, talking about this as well as Danny. Don't fall into a false sense of security living in a gated community. The only thing a gated, gated community controls is vehicle traffic. I mean, you've got folks that can come to Moss Creek by boat, by foot, by bicycle, by skateboard. You've got young folks that are living in the community. What they call it is they call it car shopping. So if you've got a group of teens, I'm not blaming teens. I'm saying if you've got a group of teens that have idle time, which is the devil's workshop, and they have nothing else to do, and they've got friends from other gated communities and they're coming over and they're spending the weekend with each other and they decide to go car shopping that night. Car shopping is getting on a bike, on foot, and they'll go and they'll check door handles. And what they do is, like Danny said earlier, all they do is walk by the car and they'll check the door handle. If it's unlocked, they'll rifle through it and they'll get what they can put in their pockets. Or maybe they've got a backpack. If there's a gun left in the car and there's a gun left in the console or the glove box, then that's the time that you'll find one of these uh, young folks that are going to be armed. But as far as them actually coming to your community, 
We have no cases where we've had any investigations where someone came to a community or to, to any community within the county uh, to uh, break into motor vehicles and are armed at the same time and have had some kind of contact uh, you know, with, with maybe the vehicle owner or another witness and there end up being some type of shooting. So, I mean, they're going, if there's a gun in your car and your car was unlocked and they got in it and they took it out of the glove box, put it in their pocket, that's when you find that they're armed. So you'll have as much crime in your community as you allow. So when I, when I tell you that, and I'll give you another number, when I, when I, when I say that we're 56 deputies short, not all deputies, but dispatchers and surveyors, the highway patrol in South Carolina is 400 short. Oh. So when the highway patrol is 400 short, that means these deputies not only are they answering calls like car break-ins, but they're also having to work more traffic because of what we know are our challenges on some of our road systems. So what we're asking you is to, to do as much as you can to protect your property, your home. How many of you have attached garage? Most all garages are attached today. Okay. How many of you treat that door that goes from the interior of your home to your garage as a part of your house? When you leave your car parked outside your garage because you got too much junk in the garage to park your car and you leave it unlocked and you've got your remote over your sun visor that opens your garage door and you don't lock the door from your garage that goes into your house, then all you're doing is asking for a visitor. We had similar cases like this some years ago. That, now, I want this to scare you, but we had cases uh, like this in Sea Pines. A few years ago, we had a young man with a video camera, and he would go about the community, and he would either go through a sliding glass door that was not locked, or he would gain access to your vehicle and open your garage door and come into your house. He was videoing women sleeping in their bed. Oh. And they never knew it. We called him. We, we went through hundreds of hours of videos. And we had to notify the victims that they were uh, they were being videoed while they were asleep. How old was that guy? He was, he was a teenager. <laughs> so, I mean, if you give that opportunity, like Danny talked about, crowds of opportunity, those are opportunities young, these young men and women will take. You give them an opportunity, they'll take advantage of it. The other thing that you got to remember is you control your community. Like I said, Jim does, they do an excellent job in here, but guess what comes into this community every day? Service industry. How many, how many landscapers have you seen today? How many of you have, you know, made service in your house? How many of you have pest control? How many of you have air conditioning company coming in to service your air conditioning units? How many contractors do you have coming in to re-roof a house? Uh, you know, do something else, paint, do whatever. All of those folks are coming in every day. They get passes to them every day. You're calling in passes every day. They're seeing what Moss Creek has to offer. If they see something in Moss Creek that's an opportunity for them and they decide to come back at three o'clock in the morning and park on US 278 and just walk through the community because they know where they're going, then those are the opportunities you get them. You got to be conscious of everything that we do. So, I mean, it's just some tidbit of information. I hope you take an opportunity and available. Question back there, sir? Yeah. If you've got a dedicated predator, could be on drugs, whatever, he's trying to break into your slider, he's already punched a glass to reach in and unlock the door, et cetera. You got a wife and children in bed, and I've got a 45. At what point? Do I drop him? If he's an obvious threat. Sure well, I get this question at every meeting, okay. and, I, and I'll give you my patent response. We cannot give legal advice when you can use force, deadly force. Ability, opportunity, and jeopardy are the three things that must be present for you to use deadly force. Ability, opportunity, and jeopardy. Barbara, you just went through this class. I did. And you know, so we, but we can't tell you when you can and cannot use deadly force. Is there a stand the ground statute here like there is in Florida? There is, but normally you'll find that law enforcement are the ones that uh, I know that's tough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, you, you've got to use your God-given common sense. No one knows what type of threat you're dealing with but you at the time of that threat. Just remember ability, opportunity, and jeopardy. If those three, if those three, if three things fit, then you make a decision at that point, what's best for you and your family. So, I mean, you gotta be careful with it. And, and once, uh, once you engage uh, in a situation like that, you've gotta be committed to whatever that engagement is. And we, we ask people all the time, you know, before you go that far, uh, again, ability, opportunity, and jeopardy, those are the things that we teach law enforcement and the use of force. Uh, and, you know, we have a, we, we have a computer system that we use uh, in a special building here in Beaufort County. We don't expose it too much, but there's 436 scenarios uh, in that computer system that we put these law enforcement officers through, and it's a shoot, don't shoot scenario. Okay. And it is it's, it's as real as it can be. It's so real that when we put uh, students through it, that we actually have them taking cover. And when the camera goes up the stairwell, how many times have you seen this? When the camera goes up the stairwell, they start walking up the stairs. And that's, that's when you know you've got them. You've got their full attention at that point. And then we can change the scenario at any time. So it's a great training tool. But again, ability, opportunity, and jeopardy. Those are the three things that we teach. One of the things the instructor really pounded on was psychology. You can't hear, you get tunnel vision, and it gets real tough to make the right decision. Well, we ask our law enforcement to make those decisions in a split second. So, but they're trained to do it, and they do a good job. I've been through one of the seminars. Those are fantastic. Oh, they're, they're pretty amazing. Worth every penny. Yes, sir. Sure. Can you speak to just what you're doing outside right now for speeding issues on 270 especially? We are working with the highway patrol to increase the patrol's presence in Beaufort County. I know it's difficult for them because they are they are so short. Well, there are right now, there are 5,000 law enforcement positions currently in South Carolina. That's over a hundred law enforcement positions per county. There's 46 counties in the state and we've got over 5,000 law enforcement positions. A lot of those are with our state agencies and we depend on our highway patrol to, to, to work our highways. Because if our highway patrol are working our highways, uh, then that means our sheriff's deputies are patrolling your communities. Are but you at the same time, 5, we're- open positions? Yes, ma'am, vacancies. Throughout the whole state. Throughout the whole, throughout the entire state. The entire state. Yes, and that's department. that's sheriff's deputies, city police officers, and and, and, and state officers. So when the highway patrol is depleted as much as they are today, it's gonna to be difficult to get more troopers. So we're asking our deputies uh, to patrol more traffic, but I get this question a lot. And folks, like I said, I've been in this business a long time and I was with the highway patrol for a number of years and I know how difficult it is to work traffic on a six lane highway. You know, I know how difficult it is to work traffic on interstate. Anyone's last time anyone traveled I-95. Mm -hmm. I hope you went and got your car repaired when you got home because <laughs> you needed a front end alignment after you got off that interstate. But in most cases, like 278, I mean, we, we've got traffic, uh, you know, on that road. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't slow down on that road uh, until, you know, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And then next morning, about 6 o'clock, 6.30, it starts back up again. It's almost impossible to be running radar eastbound and running radar in westbound traffic. You cannot get to the violator. You can't get turned around to try to catch the violator. So we have to try to work all of our traffic in the same direction. So we use unmarked cars to do, we'll just do a, a ride, we'll get to center lane and we'll travel uh, westbound into Sun City uh, and see if we can get a violator that's trying to cut traffic. You've all seen them, they've done it in front of you. Uh, and then we'll stop. And once we stop that one car, then we lose several hundred violators while we're writing a citation for that one vehicle. It is a difficult challenge, uh, uh, but these guys and gals, they do it. Uh, we write thousands of, of speeding tickets and thousands of warnings every year. I think to, to some extent, we have a percentage of deterrence, uh, but we've got more cars and we've got law enforcement. 
Uh, we've got more violators than we've got blue lights. So we just have to keep, you know, you know, and here's the other thing too. And I, I'm, I'm one of these guys and I don't apologize for it. Um, as many years as I've been in this job, I'm, I'm the guy that's going to be as tough on crime as you can find. I believe that's the deterrent. I believe that Alcatraz, when Alcatraz was a prison, it was a deterrent. The daycares that we have now on our, that we call prisons aren't deterring anyone from doing anything. If a traffic fine in magistrate's court for 20 miles over the speed limit on US 10, 278 is, is $1,000, it's $1,000. Don't go to court with a $1,000 fine and, and let go for $50. You're not deterring anyone from doing anything other than, oh, this was pretty good. This was easy enough. If the points assessment to your driving privilege should be six points for that 20 over the speed limit, you paid a thousand dollar fine and you lose six points against your driving privilege. Let that be a calling. Let that be a reckoning to you that if I don't slow down, I'm going I'm to go broke. If I don't slow down, I won't have a driver's license and I will lose my privilege to operate a motor vehicle on the highways and byways of South Carolina. You can't be soft on these things. There are things that we do in law enforcement that we have programs for that we find that once we identify the suspect or, or make an arrest in it and we identify it and, and why, why this crime occurred. I mean, there are programs that we use all the time. We make recommendations to the courts on a regular basis on what we think could happen or should happen. And this, the, the mediation with this person would be beneficial if you did this, that, or the other. But when you've got someone who drives under suspension because they lost their, their privilege to drive, and then, and, and then they're continuing, you know, we arrest them time after time after time after time for driving under suspension and driving 20 over the speed limit on US 278 and rush hour, then you've got to hold those people accountable. There's got to be consequences for those things. You know, we, we've always asked for voluntary compliance. And I can ask everyone in this room, please give voluntary compliance when it comes to following our laws, being good to your neighbor. And when you drive our roadways, drive like, you know, like you've got a little bit of sense. I guarantee you I'll get 100% of voluntary compliance out of this room. You're not the violators. Those the violators that we deal with out there every day are the ones we deal with every day. It's almost a revolving door in our court system. We deal with them time after time after time. You, you've got to have consequences for bad action. And that's it. Just it's going to make our community safe. Yes. I have a comment about 278 and Buffalo and the Parkway. Um, how do we get our local state highway patrol, Buffalo PD? And the occasional Beaufort County Sheriff's deputy and blocking the view in the middle of the road by parking doing traffic. Malthus Road turn coming out of Moss Creek, going down Malthus Road, turning left in the Lowe's parking lot. You'll have a state highway patrol sitting right there in between the uh, eastbound lane and the left turn signal lane on the other side, sitting right there in the middle of the road blocking view so I can't see cars coming behind them. Um, Bluffton PD, Buckwaller Parkway will be sitting in the middle of the turn signal or the uh, traffic circle, blocking view around the traffic circle so you can't see people. I mean, that's a very good point. <laughs> Bluffton Parkway, sorry. Um, I, mean, that's, I mean, those are very valid they, points. They were, they were out there on the highway the other day. Could okay. see people so coming cool. Around you have, I've only seen one instance where we've had Beaufort County doing it, and it was in an F-150 uh, patrol vehicle right in front of Kroger's down by uh, Belfair, sitting in the middle of the road and blocking the turn going left. Now, but he was part in the in he the, 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 the media. Yeah. Blocking. Okay, you know. I tell you what I can handle. I can do that. I can call uh, my contacts with Highway Patrol. I can talk to Stephanie Price, the new chief from Bluffton PD, and I can definitely pass the word to my guys and gals to be very, very cautious about doing that. Uh, I, I would like to 
I know it's not going to be perfect. Well, no, I'd like to see on each occasion, you know, why they were there and what they were doing. If they were well, sitting there running traffic. The highway patrol was sitting there talking. Well, uh, with the highway patrol, you're, you're, you're right. Um, um, I but, mean, uh, I know exactly what they were doing. Yeah. And I ended up picking up the phone and calling dispatch and having to do it. Oh, okay. Okay. But well, I'll do that. But, you know, on one hand, I think they think they're doing the right thing. I mean, I do understand what you're saying. They think that they're visible well, and was, that visibility a will. Dodge Charger, yeah. And I was in an F-150. I can't see past him because of where he was to do a safe left turn. I will definitely pass that word. Thank you. I appreciate it. Jim. Thank you. Any other questions for any of us? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Miller, uh, Officer Danny said that lighting was very important in terms of uh, deterrence. Are there any plans in Wall Street to add some lighting, you know, decorative, not prison lights, but you know, <laughs> of lighting to, 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 to um, deter a deterrent? Not at this time. I mean, we haven't really talked about lighting. We're doing, trying to do a comprehensive look at really perimeter security in that sense, but. What we're encouraging is for residents to put on uh, motion triggered lights. We don't know, we've got a, a policy in the community that lights, outdoor lights are not supposed to be on after 11 o'clock, with exceptions, obviously. If you've got somebody coming or going or, or whatever, um, that's not a problem. If you've got a motion activated light, that's not a problem. But the community does like dark. I mean, that's. I thought that was only for garages. Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought that 11 o'clock was only for the garage. No, it's for, no. Yeah, it's, it's for outdoor lighting. You know, the, the best deterrent lighting that we found, and I know Danny, he does a lot of security surveys. Motion activated lighting is, is great. Okay, because it only stays on for a few seconds. Uh, but, you know, wildlife and other things will create a problem. The best light, the best deterrent for you to see what's going on outside of your home while you're in your home is landscape lighting. Landscape lighting is best because landscape lighting puts off the right amount of light for you. If, if you're if you're if your home is dark and you look outside and you've got a moonlit night, we got a full moon. You can pretty well see about everything out in your yard. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's it's the same common sense approach to lighting. You want to keep the lighting low. You know, and landscape lighting has always been the best for doing that. And that that's what I'm talking about. And, a, and emotion sensor lighting is, you know, but on Hilton Head, uh, you can't do a lot of lighting because you might be a turtle. And you got to be careful. About it. <laughs> Jim, yes. I, I know that you have mentioned that if people have uh, security cameras that they bought since they're relatively cheap, that you guys would. At least help them. We're happy to help. We're, we're happy to. Um, they are very easy to install, but if you do have problems, we're happy to help. I mean, the, the more we have uh, to assess and uh, help us do our job, the better. Um, when you have somebody jumping over a fence, they're they're trespassing in the community. You want to know when they're near your house. That's that's the thing, and those kinds of cameras will give us that specific information, and and will help in the investigative aspect of it. Again, we had twenty five cars, not a one camera, not a one dog bark, and not a one call to security. So, very helpful. I, I don't, I'm not endorsing Ring Doorbell or any, any other company, but <laughs> I mean, for a hundred or hundred and fifty dollars you really can protect your own home to that point. Uh, and you and you know, there's there's so many settings on it. You want it 50 feet, you want it five feet outside your door so that the animals aren't setting it off. You, you know, individual, your own preference. But the more we have to help us, the better it will be. Yes, ma'am. I've noticed a lot more people that you have hired that we don't know. Is, and we don't exactly have a lot of time at the gate to meet these folks. Has there ever been a thought of having one of these to meet these people, meet your new hires? We're happy to. Um, I wish I could hire more people easily, to be honest with you. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. Um, 
we only have had one or two actually of new hires. So there isn't a lot of people out there. What I've had to do with smoke and mirrors is cover a lot of shifts. So you might see people on different shifts that have been here for a long time, just not typically at the time you see them. So yeah, we, we're happy to, we, we want to meet the community. You know, some of the officers, they're, they're so friendly. We want to know you. We want to know things about you. In, in that regard, of you're leaving, you're going back up to New York, you know, Don. Well, you know, uh, we love an New York. article or something in the Advocate saying, hey, we just hired a person here. This is his background. Just so you don't think, oh, now who's this weird guy that's at the gate now, you know? Right. Yeah, that would be a good spot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. We're, you know, and we're, we're happy to do that. We're happy to give background. Most of our officers have either had law enforcement, military background, <laughs> um, so they, they know what they're doing. Uh, they, they do. And, and we know our limits, uh, but we have a very good rapport with the sheriff's office. So health and welfare check. So do you think something's wrong? Just call us. We'll go to the house. If we do not make contact with that person, we call dispatch back and let them know what the case is. They'll ask the obvious questions, any signs of forced entry, any of those things. They'll send a deputy out and 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 check on the situation. Same thing with um, fire EMS. Talk about it. every scenario is different. So who should you call? Again, as 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 the sheriff and staff sergeant said, case by case basis. Nine one one. You can call non emergency, but you can also call us afterwards. The other thing is, again, depending on the situation, dispatch may stay on the phone with you. They may, they may want to speak with you constantly. If you hang up with them, call us. Talk to the person at the gate. We're happy to drive out there as the deputies or as the patrol officer is going out. Again, he's calling back on the radio. And he's feeding dispatch key information because these guys want to know exactly what's going on, whether that's fire, EMS, or law enforcement. I hope you all have our gate number in your phones. If you don't, I know we're giving out numbers here, but I'm, I'm happy to give ours out as well because we're here 24 seven and we're happy to help you. So if you need that number, 836, I'm sorry, 837-2233. If you put that in your phone, again, just another lifeline for you to help out. Any other questions? You're very welcome. I, I'd like to thank Sheriff Tanner again, Staff Sergeant Allen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you. So thank you. Appreciate you coming. No, but in any any what I usually tell folks, go back and tell us. Just in case the time frame that we just talked about. But look at a few things that were interesting. A lot of times people ask, what's a good day for you? All of the people we talk about. Especially if you So look at a few things, just in case it doesn't work. And like, for example, today, I have a few things. If it is something that maybe it's maybe better to see the other side of 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 the
Yeah, it should be, which is a great correspondence. 